You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out. Basic to complex. This is Options Boot Camp. Remember, options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, please read the characteristics and risks of standardized options available at www.sogotrade.com. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Boot Camp Drill Instructors, Mark Longo. Dan Passarelli and John Critchley. All right, everybody, welcome back to Options Bootcamp, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, where we break down and analyze some basic options concepts, strategies, and tactics and tell you how you can use those in your own portfolio. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the aforementioned Options Insider Radio Network. We have 13 programs on said network, a baker's dozen of content for you, including many, many archived episodes of this here program, Options Bootcamp. And where can you find all of this great content? Well, of course, surf right on over to the mothership, the flagship, theoptionsinsider.com. That's where you can find all 53 archived episodes of Options Bootcamp, as well as 400-plus of the Option Block, 100-plus of Volatility Views. It goes on and on, listeners. Over, well over 1,000 hours of hardcore options and derivatives content for you guys to check out. Just click on the Insider Radio Network tab there, top left of the website, and you're off to the races. Of course, you can also find it, iTunes, Stitcher, AHA Mobiles, just about wherever you find your finer podcast programs, tune in, etc. all of that fun stuff. And if that wasn't enough for you, no, sir, we also have the mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the Fire OS. So no shortage of ways for you guys to check out this content and download it, listen to it on the go, stream it, however you like to enjoy it. We don't care. As long as you tune in, we don't care how you do it. We're happy to have you. And joining me on the old Options Boot Camp program yet again, my options educational compatriot, the yin to my yang, the dark side to my light side, none other than Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, as well as the author of a myriad of options tomes. Mr. P, welcome back to the program, sir. Oh, I'm doing splendid today on this balmy Chicago winter morn. It is a little balmy, about nine degrees worth of bomb. So if that qualifies as balmy, then I suppose we're hitting it. And listeners, you guys have been hitting us up quite a bit as well with all sorts of great questions and comments and insights and things to share with your fellow listeners. So we thought without further ado, let's let you guys take over the show and answer what you guys want to know. So without further ado, we're going to dive into a mail call palooza. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail call segment. As the name implies, this is the portion of the program where you guys take over, send us your questions, your comments, your insights, all your fun stuff, and we do our best to answer them here on the old program. We'll start off with a nice little comment, getting a little bit of love from uh, Mr. Max. Max P24, he writes, Options Bootcamp, one of the best podcasts for options trading. They have an amazing bootcamp for options beginners. Well, thank you for that love. We get a lot of that stuff here on the show. I don't, I don't feature it all the time, but every now and then it's nice to have a little bit of love starting off the old show. How about that, Mr. P? You get the nice, warm, fuzzy feeling to start the show? 
Oh, shucks. Thanks, Max <laughs> P24. <laughs> Gotta love Max P24. Everybody's everybody's favorite. All right, let's move on to some actual questions. If you guys remember, listeners, on a recent show, we discussed Theta Decay, and a listener had a question about, isn't it, is it better to write options farther away from at the money in like a 60 to 70 day range rather than in that 30 day window, which we talk about a lot here on the show, which is where, of course, you get that exponential uh, rate of decay as you get into the final weeks of an options lifespan. And he was referring to out of the money options versus in the money options. Uh, his name is Brian. And he wrote a follow up uh, to that question. It was actually on one of our other programs, but it, it, we, it was so central, I think, to this audience as well. We, we featured it on this show as well, and so I wanted to make sure we get his, his follow-up as well. Uh, his question, if you, remember, if you remember, I'll read it for you here again, listeners. He writes, you mentioned that when selling options, the fastest theta decay occurs in the 45 to 30-day range. I thought it was, that was only true for at-the-money options. Don't out-of-the-money options decay the fastest at 60 to 70 days and then kind of flatten out? And Dan and I discussed that a bit on the last show. He had mentioned some data, and I wasn't really familiar with it, and Dan wasn't either about about data that show a good study uh, that shows uh, this sort of thing. He, and he didn't reply uh, with a study, but he sent some links that he wanted us to check out, uh, which are from a few different communities, including LiveVol and a few others. And people had some charts of the different rates of decay of out-of-the-money options versus at-the-money options. And he does kind of bring up a good point. Uh, he also mentions he thinks futures roundtable needs to be twice a month in his opinion. I agree with you there, <laughs> Brian. We're working on getting that show more frequent for you, back on the network and more frequent. Uh, we're in some revamping, retooling period with that one, but we're going to get more futures content coming, so that one's easy to answer. But the other part, Dan, is an interesting part of the question, too, and it kind of I think a lot of our listeners may have encountered this already if they have had some experience writing a covered call or writing an option, and they see that they get a decent amount of decay. If, let's say they write like a two-month option. They get a decent amount of decay in that first month or so, and then, of course, it gets down to the lower levels of decay. Maybe it decays down to 15 cents a dime, somewhere in that range, and then it kind of sticks there for a while, and it's really, really hard to get that final dime to 15 20 cents worth of decay out of that option you really have to wait until almost expiration friday for that stuff to really be squeezed out of it and that's kind of what they're referring to here in this data too is that you see that nice reg regular steady rate of decay uh for that 90 to 60 day time frame whatever it is in these three months options that they're talking about here so about that 90 to 60 day time frame and then it kind of flattens out the actual rate of decay it's not increasing and then of course towards the end of the options we get that you get that exponential because it's going to go to zero if it's not on the option uh but the rate of decay is actually relatively slow in terms of how much how many actual how much actual cash income you're generating uh, on a daily basis and that seems to be the the consensus of that those links he sent us dan is that essentially if you're writing in that 60 day time frame or so 60 to 70 day time frame you take it off after the final 30 days, you get to avoid, you know, the gamma risk. We all know gamma explodes as you get close to expiration. So it gets to become a very dangerous from a short gamma perspective. You're not collecting a lot of net premium. So the total amount of income you're getting is maybe low. And also it's not going to decay very fast until those final few days when it kind of just implodes. So it's, it, it's, they seem to be advocating more along the lines of uh, taking what you can get in the early part of the options life cycle and then moving on to the next trade and avoiding maybe the near portion of the curve where that, yeah, that, that decay gets exponential, but it's also pretty dangerous waters. Is that your consensus as well here, Dan, from looking at this data? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm looking at it and, um, and this, this, this is from the live out blog, I believe, right? Is where this. Appeared. Yeah. That's where he pulled it from. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, those guys definitely know what they're talking about over there, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to, prior to reading this and probably still even after reading it, I, I imagine that I would still recommend to my students to sell within 30 days to expiration. I mean, yeah, the gamma's bigger and such, but um, you're, you're just, you're getting bigger thetas. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm uh, taking a very simple approach here, but if you're selling stuff, you want high theta. I mean, and that is where the highest theta is going to be for at the money options. Yeah, I think they're focusing more on the out of the money stuff, you know, and saying how the out of the money has a bit of a a bit of a trickier decay rate as you get towards the the final days of its lifespan there, you know. Whereas at the money, you're right, it gets that pure uptick in the curve. Uh, if they're talking about out of the money covered call, or out of the money puts that people are writing, uh, the the theta versus gamma trade off gets a little wonky in those final days. I think that's what they were trying to say. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it does. And I mean, I can, I can see that. I don't know. I, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying I advocate it. I'm just trying to explain it for our listeners. They can see it. it's hard to describe the entirety of this link uh, in just a few words here. And again, I don't, I'm not familiar. This is from Live Vol blog, but they have a lot of different contributors on there. I'm not familiar with these particular contributors uh, who wrote this up. So what they're right, what you know, their level of expertise and what they're talking about, I don't know. I can't vouch for them. I could just say uh, the data is kind of interesting, and I, I appreciate listeners sending in data uh, to back up their questions because I hadn't seen, and there still aren't any studies done a lot on this but they are it's an interesting approach again for the at the money is definitely this you know that that range is where you want to be and of course at the end of the day dan kind of a lot of this is obviated by the fact that no matter what we say here the lion's share of our listeners are out there writing weeklies and that's where they're playing in their short <laughs> in their short premium trade so they're all living in that south of 30 day expiration curve uh, in which case you know all this talk of 60 to 90 days is kind of moot to them yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I don't know, as I'm sort of internalizing some of what I'm looking at here, um, yeah, the the ratios of theta to gamma and, and all that kind of stuff can get, uh, I think you put it very eloquently when you said wonky. Um, it's you a know, technical term, sir. Yeah, yeah technical term, right. Um, but the bottom line is, I mean, you're still... If you're selling options, you're still going to want to get the meteor theta, you know. And so, I, I sure appreciate the fact that you you know you have to look towards optimizing the Greeks. I mean, there's nobody who's going to advocate that more so than me, I think. But it's just kind of a waste to sell something and put on a risk trade, you know. And when you're selling options, you tend to have greater risk than reward potential for so you know for so far out um yeah i don't know man uh i'm definitely not a naysayer i'm definitely not saying like disagreeing for sure not but i just feel like it's it's a more decisive and active trade if you're just doing it the good old-fashioned way that i've been recommending for years and you know just so shorter term stuff somewhat near the money and there you there you have it you're getting you're getting the most bang for your buck theta wise that way i i think yeah, you're, you're probably getting an option that's going to be whatever, 25, 30 cents, and all things held uh, equal, it's going to go to zero. And you're going to do it in probably a month or so, or maybe even less if you're doing weeklies. Uh, if you're doing far out of the money stuff, and you, you have to almost go out 90 days or so to get any real meat on those bones. It's going to be worth selling more than a few cents. Uh, so you have to go out 90 days. And so this sounds like they're kind of advocating the approach of go out 90 days, sell, let's say, I don't know, a 55 cent option and let it decay down to 35 cents and then get the heck out before things get risky. And that's not my not my preferred approach either, but I can certainly see uh, the mindset of that, even though, like I said, a lot of our listeners, a lot of the people just in the general daily options flow have become just engrossed in the weeklies. They are pretty much pure theta machines. And as long as you're okay with the gamma risks out there, which are going to be substantial, uh, then I could certainly advocate or see the reasoning behind that approach as well. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying it's a, it's a different approach. And I think for a lot of our listeners, they, they lean the other way. But certainly, if you're concerned about that gamma risk and you're doing a lot of naked options, you're not doing spreads, which we, we don't advocate here either, uh, then maybe this approach is for you. Certainly, you can probably sleep a little better at night, even if it isn't uh, the sexiest approach and you're taking things off before that maximum amount of decay really, really hits. Interesting ideas. We'd love to have you guys send us your, your interesting ideas, even if they're different than what we say here. We, we, we're open to contrary points of view. We're open to all of them. So great questions. Uh, keep them coming. We've got another one here, Dan. This one comes from, this is more uh, on the sexier side of options. We're talking about exercise and settlement. So bear, batten down the hatches for this one. This one comes from a listener goes by the handle Imbroglio. And he or she writes, if I exercise a call option, what happens? Do I just hit a button? And the stock hits my account, or does it take some time? When do I actually get the stock? If I want to collect the dividend, do I need to exercise a few days early in order to get the stock in time to collect the dividend? Well, a great question here, Mr. or Mrs. Imbroglio. Yeah, it, this seems to be a common misperception out there with, with newcomers to the options landscape. They think that they can just hit that exercise button or whatever the case may be on their platform of choice, and the stock just miraculously appears in their account. That's not really how it works. There's, there's the settlement is the period that has to go through. I believe it's still T plus three, which is trade plus three. I know the people in the business are trying to get that down to T plus one, so trade date plus one, but it's still a bit of a, of a uh, 
of a of a boondoggle behind the scenes uh, to make that happen. The reason it was T plus three for the longest time was you'd exercise on a Friday. People would come in on the weekends. The clearing house would have the chance to sit down. I used to do this when I was a clerk. I'm sure Dan did too. We have fun days coming on the weekends. Expiration Saturday, really early in the morning on the clearing house, down to the exchange, check the out trades, make sure, oh, you think you sold 10, but I have you buying four. Uh, so we have to mix up, we have to match those trades up and, and reconcile all the out trades. It was a manual and laborious process. That's why all that stuff took they gave them three days to get all that sorted out. In today's environment where everything is pretty much matched electronically and out trades, if they do exist, are, are rectified relatively instantaneously, that T plus three is, is relatively antiquated. Uh, so they are trying to work on getting that into some sort of better time frame. Instant would be ideal. It's not really happening yet, but T plus one, trade day plus one would be a nice uh, addition. So right now, at least, you hit that exercise button. Uh, you're going to get it a few days from now. So bear that in mind when you hit that button for the account. We should also mention, too, we've said this before on the show, but when you're exercising, you're effectively selling that option, but really you're just selling it for the intrinsic value, the meat on those bones. You're not getting any of that fun stuff we talk about here, like the time premium, the volatility premium. All that stuff kind of goes away. You're just getting that intrinsic value of the call, and that's it, which is why we always say it's always better to sell that option in the marketplace because you'll do a lot better from a pure value perspective than tend to just exercise it, except for the scenario he lays out here, Dan, which is to get a dividend. So why don't you walk our buddy here, Mr. and Mrs. Imbroglio, through uh, when they should exer- when they should time their exercises they want to capture a dividend. Yeah, I mean, it's almost sort of... Uh... I mean, saying it's antiquated is, is yeah, absolutely. It, it's kind of funny, like, you don't really care what goes on in the back office if you're, like, a regular old trader, like, a typical person listening to this, you know? Yeah, I until mean, it if, impacts you, then you want it instant. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, I mean, in order to get the dividend, you what you do is you exercise your calls that are that are exercises that you that you should exercise you know where there's very little time premium that you're giving up because when you exercise an option if there's any time premium that's money that you're throwing away and you would only do that if the time premium is less than the dividend you're getting but i digress so if you're going to exercise to convert the call to stock so that you can get the dividend you do it at the very last moment you do it on the last day that you can and so that date is the day before the X date. How it works, there's like four dates for dividends. There's the, the day you actually get the check, which is the furthest in the future, payable date. There's the date of record. That's whoever actually owns the stock on this particular date, at this particular time, at the close of business on this date, they get the dividend. But that lead time, that T minus three, is the X date. So three days before that is the X date. So you have to exercise the day before the X date. Now, truth be told, I mean, I think a lot of times when you're looking up information, I mean, sometimes you'll just see the X date and you don't have to go, oh, well, here's the date of record. Let me subtract three days from that. You know, you just find out when the X date is and exercise the day before. Yep, pretty good shorthand. And it's worth uh, reiterating what you talked about there, Dan, Dan, that the shorthand for if you want to exercise, remember, if you're a call holder, you don't get the dividend. Only stockholders get the dividend. So you need to trade your call for stock. You need to exercise in order to get that dividend. And what Dan said is, is completely correct. It's a great shorthand for it. If you have that call and you look at the put on that same strike, uh, you could see what that put is trading for. And that's going to give you the exactly because that put typically is going to be, uh, you know, all time premium or mostly. And you can see oh, if that put if the dividend is worth more uh, than the price of that put, then you should exercise. It's a pretty, pretty simple, pretty simple uh, mechanic there. If not, you're not it's not worth doing that dividend isn't worth capturing. And so you don't need to worry about it. Good question. Uh, everyone who likes in with all that fun stuff, all the sexy stuff about settlement and exercise. And again, you have different things. Securities settle different ways than options do. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and when you actually get that stock in your account, Mr. and Mrs. Imbroglio. But figure sometime in that T plus three time frame is usually when you'll get uh, that stock. So bear that in mind. And what Dan said about the dividends timing is correct, which is why we see all those div plays we talk about on the Options Insider and some of our other shows. People, the explosion of dividend volume, people trying to game that dividend right before that ex-dividend date. So that's why we see a lot of those going up as well. 
All right, next question. This is a good one for you, uh, Mr. Pastor. I refuse to answer this question because I hate this terminology, but it's a fun one nonetheless. I can I can share his pain. This one comes from a listener who goes by the great handle, Angry Bunny. I like that. He writes, what the hell is a front spread? How does it differ from a back spread? Who the hell comes up with these names? They seem to make no sense. <laughs> I like that. I can certainly feel your pain and your anger there, Angry Bunny. Now, these, this terminology, front spread, back spread, I, these ones in particular really, really bug me. I don't like them. I, I, that's why I kind of commiserate with you there, Mr. Bunny. Uh, this is, these are spreads. I never really use these a lot. Maybe, Dan, you did on the floor. I never really use these tra- uh, terminology on the floor. I always just call them ratio and ratio verticals, and that's kind of about it. I never really got into the, the front and back spread. It just wasn't used a lot. It wasn't until I, I started, you know, the options side of media group. I started dealing with people more on the retail side of the fence as well. That I started hearing this front spread, back spread kind of terminology thrown around. And, and for the life of me, for years now, I, I've been trying to divine the origin, the source, the etymology for what the hell, <laughs> where these names come from. I've yet to hear a, a rational answer for why they're called a front spread or a back spread. Uh, so maybe we'll start there. Dan, maybe you have the secret sauce I'm not aware of. Maybe you know why they're called that. And then after that, you can follow up and tell our listeners what the heck we're actually talking about. Well, somebody told me, gave me a, a, a rationale for this at some point. And I don't, know, I don't know if it's true or if this person was just blowing smoke. But apparently a backspread, uh, which guys is when, or, and gals, is when you sell a call and then you buy two or more out of the money calls like more out of the money calls um so basically it's a ratioed spread where you're buying more options than yourself i was told that those trades became very popular in the back months and and that (laughs) those trades when they work out they tend to work out better with longer term options and thus you know there were back month spreads back hmm. spreads i don't buy it but it's it's about as as plausible as anything else i've heard yeah exactly right <laughs> i know um and yeah you know like on the trading floor i had a similar experience i mean i don't remember anybody ever coming in and quoting a back spread yeah give trading. me the give me the july you know 1 105 front spread you, you never heard that no but I, I did sometimes use the term backspread in a different manner um, because backspreads are options where you, or are spreads where you own more options than you're short, thus you have positive gamma. And so whenever I had positive gamma, I would I, that would be synonymous to me. I would just use the phrase, yeah, well, I'm backspread in you know Ford's Ford or whatever. Um, and that didn't necessarily mean that I have one of these, you know, classical ratio spreads where I'm short this option and long three of these options. It was just, yeah, I got gamma on back spread. It is, it is sort of an interesting study. We could probably do a whole show on this, how the nomenclature of what we, how we use terms on the trading floor is actually very different than uh, how people use yeah. the same terms, you know, in, in retail land. It is a weird beast. I, 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 that's why I wanted to kind of bring this question up, too. I think we touched on some similar questions before. And the definitions are certainly worthwhile mentioning again. But it's just the impenetrable nature of some of this jargon, people who are coming to it uh, for the first time. And that really, that makes no sense. We've been in the business for a long time. It still makes no sense to us, those names, let alone someone coming to this for the first time. Front spread, what does that mean? I can only do it in the front month? You know, back spread, does that mean I can only do it in the back month? You know, what? What is what does any of that really mean? It's really it's it's unfortunate. I think we need to. That's why I always call them. I just call them. I call it simple ratio spread. Uh, and that's usually the, the terminology when I say ratio because that just seems to be where most people gravitate towards. I mean the ones where you're net short, you're long one, short two, vice versa. Because that's the lion's share of what we see out there in the marketplace. People coming in unusual activity, buying one, selling two to finance it, buying one, selling three, whatever the case may be, uh, two, three, whatever the ratio is. Uh, we see a lot of those. We see less of the old back spread where they're net long units. Uh, so maybe there needs to be something. But when I, when I see those, I just kind of say that they're a, a different kind of ratio spread. I say it's a ratio spread. They're net longer. So it's, it's pretty easy uh, to intuit what we're talking about. You don't need this kind of impenetrable jargon. Speaking of jargon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to diverge here for a second, Dan. Listeners, if you haven't had a chance, check out our Options Playbook show. I encourage you to do it. It's kind of our weekly show. We do it with our friends over there at Trade King. Brian Overby is their educator over there. He's a great educator. He's been around the business for a long time. And uh, he does a lot of different strategies and breakdowns every week. And and Dan, you should listen to one of his recent episodes because I checked it out. It was kind of funny. Uh, he was 
talking about a strategy I love. I talk about all the time. I advocate all the time. We talked about it on this show even. And that is, of course, we talk about covered calls a lot, but swapping out the underlying for a leap and then writing the covered calls against that. And you kind of leg into this kind of ratio or not ratio, but you leg into this diagonal kind of almost a synthetic kind of covered calls, a lot of different terminology for it, but there's no real name for that. I just call it, typically I call it a, uh, you know, swapping leap for uh, underlying covered call, which is, isn't really the sexiest of names. And I think he was talking about it on his show, and he polled their, their users and listeners over at Trade King, and someone came up with the idea of the fig leaf strategy. So he's putting that, I forgot, he told me what the reasoning was behind it, because it, it grows like a leaf, something like that. But whatever it was, it was a heck of a lot better than, uh, than just calling it a, you know, substitute leap covered call kind of strategy. So what do you <laughs> think about that, calling that a fig leaf? Will, will you get on that train? Uh, no, I don't think so, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was trying to put it out there for you. Okay, yeah. you, now you need to come up with your own uh, contrary suggestion, and we'll have them battle it out. Right. <laughs> we'll the great uh, terminology face-off here. Uh, on the show as we move on to another question great question there mr bunny i feel your pain i think if you just stick with the the ratio you'll pretty much be good uh let's see uh we go on here to question from neil Tompkins. Uh, he writes how do i know when an option is going to be less liquid what are some good suggestions for dealing with less liquid options so a, a twofer here in his question you know we talk a lot here on this network and some of our other shows about analyzing a lot of things. We obviously do a lot of unusual activity analysis here. So we talk about open interest, we talk about implied volatility, we talk about volume, we talk about all of those things and how they relate back to the option and how you can use those to kind of parse the liquidity and things like that. But at the end of the day, there's a very simple way to do this. Uh, if you look at your option, all of that information is going to be embodied in the bid ask spread of that option. You know, market makers are not fools. They take all that into consideration when they're trading and making markets for these options. So if you look at an option, it's about three cents wide, <laughs> then you can say to yourself, well, this is pretty tight. This is a, probably a fairly liquid option. You can also look at the bid ask spread, see how much size is available there. Uh, but the, generally, the tightness, the size of that spread is going to give you a very good indication of just how liquid that option is. Whereas you pick a less liquid option, you look at it, and you say, well, wait a minute, this is actually 50 cents wide or whatever the case may be. Well, then you know, hey, this is probably one I need to be a little more cautious, a little more careful with. Clearly, there's not a lot of volume going up here. I need to, uh, to, uh, to trade accordingly. And of course, when you look at options, there's going to be, tends to be a, an aggregation of liquidity or I don't care what name it is, around front month at the money options. That's where the lion's share of your volume is always going to go up. I don't care if it's Apple or Facebook or corn options or whatever the case may be. It's going to be front month at the money, and the few strikes around that range are going to be the most active. The farther away you get from at the money and the farther out you go in time, the less liquid those options are generally going to become. Even for big names like Apple and stuff, you get out six months or more and get to some farther out of the money strikes, it's not going to be as liquid as that front month at the money. So just bear that in mind, the farther out in time you go and the farther away from the at the money you go, you're going to see less liquidity. The spreads are going to be wider and you're going to have a harder time getting executed on the trade. You have to sell closer to the bid, buy closer to the offer to really get anything done. The probability of you working a mid-market offer and then someone stepping up and filling you, pretty remote because they don't have much of an incentive to do that because there's no paper out there. Uh, so that's kind of our shorthand for looking at where the liquidity is. Mr. P, Mr. Passarelli, do you have any tips you'd like to share with your students for when they encounter an option series that is perhaps a little bit less liquid? Yeah, I mean, don't trade it. <laughs> Let's start with that. No, that that's not a bad, not bad advice. <laughs> yeah. Let's say you have to go out into Joe Blow name no one's ever heard of. What, what should you do? Well, I mean, I think you have to try and middle the markets whenever you can. And there is surely an art to middling markets. Typically, you're able to middle markets better with spreads than with outright options. Any trade that has a lower delta, I think you're typically able to middle markets a little bit better um, because market makers have less stock, immediate stock risk. So, uh, I mean, I think that's really what your number one concern is. Like, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, I want to make sure this is liquid. Well, why do you want to make sure it's liquid? Like, what's the motivation? And the motivation is is singular. It's all the only motivation is, you know, hey, I want to know that when I want to sell this call that I just bought later, that there's actually going to be a bid, you know, and that it's the market's not going to be so wide that I'm giving up so much slippage. 
So, I mean, that's really the risk. Try and avoid trading those really wide markets. If you have to, you know, try and middle them. I mean, at least middle it getting in because maybe you're not going to be able to middle it getting out, but hopefully you can do it both ways. Yeah, middling is always, you know, the first step. And then hopefully someone will come up and fill you. Chances are they probably won't. There are some good good brokers out there. We do um, stuff with uh, Options Express a lot, obviously, on our network, and they have a cool new tool. Uh, they call the walk limit order where you could start at that mid-level and then it'll walk your order in whatever case down or up depending on where you want to go if you want to buy it'll move it closer to the offer and you could set the increments and it'll kind of work your order for you so you don't have to babysit it as much and it'll kind of test the waters at each different increment all the way up to the offer of the bid so it might be a good way to try something like that too maybe your broker has something that approximates that functionality or you can do it yourself manually, uh, and that way you can kind of test the waters at each individual level before just jumping in and just you know lifting an offer, hitting a bid. Uh, but in general, yeah, if, you, if if Dan's advice is good, if you can avoid it, by all means do so. But sometimes that's a little bit easier said than done. In which case, you need to be a little bit more judicious with how you execute those trades because if it's going to cost you a ton to get in and out, then it may not be worth uh, doing that trade at all. Good question there, uh, Mr. Tompkins. Going to move on to another one here. Talking about Apple, everyone's got Apple on the brain, particularly these days. Dan, this one came into our, our playbook show uh, a little while ago, earlier in February, but I thought it was worth uh, discussing here as well because it gets to a question a lot of the listeners of this show I know uh, will have as well. This came from Jason uh, Jason Daig. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. He writes, I am long Apple from about $99. Well, first off, congratulations, Jason. Good trade. He goes on to write, I have a protective put on right now. At 105 for July. So he has the 105 strike protective put listeners. He goes on to write, when do you know whether to roll your put up? I am obviously down on the put by approximately 70% uh, from where I bought it in November. I believe in this when this email came in, Apple was trading right around the low uh, 120s. So his put had a lot of time to go, but it didn't really, it wasn't really that effective from a protective standpoint anymore because it was almost 20 handles out of the money. Not a bad problem to have because your stock has rallied quite a bit, so you're probably a happy camper. I'm sure Jason was smiling, uh, but you still have the question of what to do uh, with that put. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dan, I had a chance to weigh in on this one pretty extensively on, on one of our other programs, so I'll give you pride of place here before I chime in. What do you what do you say to your listeners when they're looking to construct these type of protected positions, and also what do you say when it works out in their favor and that put is kind of languishing there and they need to really adjust it? Well, it's kind of tricky. Like the when I talk to people who are brand new to options, and I I tell them, well, you can hedge stock by buying a put. That is the most basic way to do a hedge. But truth be told, it's very, very expensive insurance. Puts are not designed in any way, shape, or form to just, you know, buy a put and keep it on long term and like maybe roll it out to a further month. Like, I don't think it says what price. No, it doesn't say what price he paid for the put. But if you bought it back in November and it's July option, I mean, we're talking about holding it for eight months. I mean, my guess is, well, let's see. No, I don't have my platform open. When right I pulled now. it up a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this. It was trading around two dollars now, so it had to be at least five dollars, if not more. You know, when you put it on. Yeah, so I mean, you're basically giving up five percent right off the bat. You know, so. What, I mean, well, I mean, I guess your specific question is, when do you know whether to roll your put up? If you roll the put up, you're just getting a more expensive put so you're paying more money for something that isn't working out and part of the reason why it isn't working out is good it's not working out because the stock has gone your way i don't think the solution is rolling up and and throwing good money after bad um i mean i think initially when you put this trade on if you bought the stock if you bought Apple at 99 back in November and bought the put at the same time, you would have been better off just buying a call, I think, right? Because that's synthetically the identical thing. You would have had one less commission and would have been easier to manage and probably easier to intellectualize. You know, once you start talking about rolling up puts and such. I mean, for me, what I would be thinking is, why did I buy the put? All right, you know, think of it that way. It looks like maybe you bought the puts either at or maybe in the money. I don't know. I It doesn't really specify the timing here. Did you pay 99 bucks for the stock and, at, and on the same day buy the 105 strike 
July options? I mean, if so, I don't know. I mean, are you bullish or bearish? Like, why are you doing that? You know, you end up with a very small bullish delta. And so the stock really has to move a lot for you to be able to make money at it. My guess is you would have done a little bit better with some sort of actively managed collar, which we, we think we've talked about on the show a number of times. You know, Jace, like I'm, I'm kind of being vague and I'm not giving like a real direct answer here. And if I had a real direct answer, I would give it to you. But I think you need to do a little soul searching, man. Like ask yourself, why, what are you trying to accomplish? And then have a position that accomplishes that. Like I, I, I think like the tenor of your question, it kind of feels like you're like, I, don't know, I bought this put. I thought it was a good idea. Now I'm losing. I don't know. Maybe I'll roll it. What do you guys think? You know, like you should really be, you're not asking the right questions. Like, what do you want to protect against? You know, let's be really decisive and do that. And I guess I need more information from you to be able to help you better. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking here while you're talking. I was pulling up some some data here. And these puts in mid-November, the 105 puts, were trading about 6 bucks. So you're, you're $99 stock, $6 on the puts. You're already giving up 6% uh, on this trade right off the bat. That, that's, a, that's a tough road to hoe for most stocks that aren't named Apple to do that in a year. You gave yourself about seven or so months. Uh, so that's a long time frame. But we, we've talked about protective puts here on this, sh- on this show in the past. And Dan is completely right. You know, you need to, when you're doing that, you need to say to yourself at the outset, what am I really hoping to accomplish here? What is the what is the goal? If you're getting angry when your stock moves 25 percent uh, that you have this put on, then maybe maybe you should think twice about putting these positions on. Certainly about putting on such a meaty put uh, at the outset like that. When we talked about constructing hedges here on the show in the past, uh, we've used the rule of thumb of somewhere in the one and a half to two percent. Uh, of your portfolio of your profits kind of thing uh, or portfolio not profits i should say uh to there's a good barometer a good rule of thumb when gauging how much to spend uh, for protection so in this case it would have been about a two dollar put as opposed to a six dollar put that you would have spent and that's something that's reasonable and that's usually for a scenario we have a stock that you have some gains and you're sitting on them now and you're kind of a little bit concerned about near-term downside you don't but you don't want to sell it either because it might rally and continue rallying so you pay that one and a half two percent and you get to sleep well for two or three months depending on how long you go but that's about that should be about two to three months relatively decent near near out of the money type put protection where you could protect most of your gains in that underlying uh so that's that's what we're talking about there when you're talking about a six seven eight month uh six seven eight percent output uh, in terms of how much you're paying on it that's a lot i would never really recommend that that's a lot to overcome and now you see you've got a, this position worked your way and it ended up costing you a substantial amount of money in terms of you I mean you made money on the underlying you're still happy it's a great trade but on the put it, you could have constructed that a lot better that's why we usually say keep it within that two to three month time frame it'll be cheaper you'll get all that decay stuff we talked about earlier but you'll also have a little bit of period where Hopefully you can adjust, and it's kind of a self-adjusting prophecy. Every two months or so, you can revisit this put you have on and say, hmm, is this really working? Hopefully the underlying has rallied. You can adjust and move to a tighter strike there if you want. I think in this scenario, he was sitting on about two bucks left on this put. So I actually kind of said, he, if, at the time when he wrote in, I said he could even have, you want this to be, if he still wants this put, doesn't want to just sell it out. He still wants protection. He's concerned about Apple. And you probably want to sell this out now and roll it back, but up to a little bit tighter uh more relevant put strike at the time i think the 117 and change uh, strike was trading right around two dollars in april so that would have given them about a two dollar excuse me a two month uh protection at without any net outlay at that point and much more relevant than a 105 strike so yeah in general you you definitely want to consider this when you first construct these positions and if you go to something like this dan's right just pick up the call you're doing the same thing synthetically you're saving yourself a lot of time a lot of commission a lot of margin and you can also free up that capital to make other trades as a result. Because that's essentially when you're buying that media of a put and you're buying the stock, that's essentially what you're doing anyway. You're synthetically buying a call. So maybe in the future, you take that route and you still would have been a happy camper right now. And you wouldn't have to be worried about all this, uh, all the other externalities of your position. OK, moving on to question from Jay. This one is still in, in put land. Uh, he writes, if, if the market is really falling out of bed. What are some good strategies to take advantage of that movement uh, while also minimizing option decay? Uh, well, decay, we love talking about decay here on the show. We're all decay all the time. Uh, this is one of those questions I love, Dan, because it kind of it presupposes that you have this 
you know, this omniscient knowledge of the markets. You know that the markets are going to crash. Uh, so what should you do in that scenario? Well, in that scenario, maybe if you know everything's going to crash, maybe you get short the underlying, get short the stock. That's probably the best thing to do. If you know 100% it's going to crash pretty aggressively, then you want the most short deltas you could possibly have. And the stock has no decay. So there you go. Get short the stock or do it synthetically with the options. I and mean, we've talked about synthetics before on this show. You know, you buy a put, sell a call on the same strike. That's now a combo. You're synthetically short uh, the underlying buying an at the money put. You're short about 50 deltas. Selling at the money call, you're short another 50 deltas. That's approximately 100 or about one delta of one. So you're going to move one to one. With the stock, so you've used the options to approximate a synthetic short position in the underlying, whatever underlying that could be. It could be stock, could be a future, whatever the case may be. You're synthetically short now. If that's a little bit too much for you, you want a little bit wider, you can always go. Of course, you can always just buy a put. We just talked about that before. That's probably the easiest way, but of course, that also has all the decay issues we talked about before. But in this scenario where the market's falling out of bed, you're not going to be too worried about the K because you're going to be making so much in the underlying movement and volatility. But that said, if that's what you're worried about, you can always buy that put and then maybe finance it with an out-of-money call as well and now a short call. So now you have essentially that reverse, that bearish risk reversal position we love so much here on the show. Kind of a collar without the stock. And now the stock drops, you can, you're looking pretty well as well. Of course, you always have the straight up put spread as well. All of those would minimize your decay. Mr. Mr. Dan, what do you like to do in these scenarios where you know everything is working your way to the downside and you don't want to pay a lot of decay? What do you have to say for our friend here, Mr. J? Well, most of the time, my answer to almost all option questions is, well, use some sort of a spread. But, I mean, in this case, no, that's not really accurate. Uh, if, if you feel like the market's really going to crap out and make a pretty significant move to the downside, you sure don't want to have a limited profit spread on um, instead, you would rather just simply outright own a good old-fashioned long put. That's it. And as far as minimizing time decay, I mean, look, man, that, sometimes you get what you pay for, you know? And time decay is just sort of paying every day for another day of owning that put. And, man, it's, if it ends up working out, who cares if you lost a week or two on time decay? No big deal. It's fine. You could manage your theta risk a little bit by going a little bit further out of the money. But what supersedes that part of your strategy is selecting the strike that really gives you the biggest bang for your buck as far as movement goes. What I like to do, you know, if I'm looking for a pretty drastic move in a scenario where maybe I have some sort of, you know, knowledge that the market's going to crash or I have a crystal ball or something, I would buy a put that's out of the money now, but would become in the money if the move that I'm looking for comes to fruition. So you want to go through your long strike, you know, because then you really maximize your gamma and your delta changes in your favor very strongly. So, yeah, man, answer, buy a put. It's pretty simple. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Not what he wants to hear, but <laughs> it'll work in that scenario. I think he'll be pretty happy. I don't think he'll be too worried about theta in that, in that scenario. <laughs> oh, I made fifty dollars, but I lost seventeen cents in decay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, woe is me. Um, so yeah, that would that would not be the worst of scenario. Let's see, we got some got some epic questions here. I'm not sure we have time to really tackle these today. So let me jump on to some a couple more short ones we can squeeze in here. Let's see. Here's an easy one, Dan. This comes from Matthew. Matthew Dilks. He writes, hi, I just listened uh, to Mark on Top Step Trader. That's a that's a hit I do on a, on a futures oriented community every week. I kind of go in and answer some of their options questions. Uh, he goes in, he goes on to ask, can you recommend which company slash broker to get a SIM slash demo account to get to grips with trading options? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Kind regards, Matt. Uh, good question for a lot of our listeners. You know, obviously, we here on the network, we work with a lot of the brokers in various capacities, they they sponsor our shows and our partners with them. Uh, so so we we do have relationships with a lot of them. But that said, we tend to establish relationships with the brokers that we like and the platforms and the partners uh, that we like and prefer. Which is why you see firms like TD and OX and some of the others, Trade King and others on there that are really option centric. That have a lot to offer for the the retail options trader. I and mean, if you're looking for you know SIM or paper trading accounts. Uh, the big houses, particularly like the OX Schwabs and the TDs, Thinkorswims, ha have really done a lot to facilitate paper trading in recent years. It used to be 
if you set up a paper trading account, you were very limited in terms of what tools you can access, what parts of the platform you could access, what kind of functionality you had available to you. You kind of had you enter a little silly trade and it would calculate your end of day value P&L. And that was kind of about it. And we've seen a lot of brokers have really realized that the paper trading is a good point of entry for their platform for a lot of people out there. And so they've made it as robust as possible. So really, these days, good platforms will allow you to come in and essentially try the whole thing soup to nuts and really get a sense for the tools because they know the tools, their tools are marketing for them. They know their tools. If they have good tools, they want you to try them because you're going to become a client and you're going to fund an account. And the same thing with their execution. They want you to see their executions. Granted, the executions in paper trading are fake, but still you can see some of that functionality as well as their how to do drop downs for ratio verticals and all that kind of fun stuff. You can really kick the tires very fully these days, which is nice to see. We've encouraged brokers to do that for years and they're, and they're finally listening. So you can kind of go in. So you really can't go wrong with any of those ones I just mentioned in terms of their paper trading uh, functionality because they they're really let you kick the tires and really take advantage of everything. on. And they can see the whole thing. You can see the whole platform. You can see all the tools. You can see all the educational stuff they have to offer and everything else. And then see if you like it. That's really what it is. It's a test run. And if you like it, if you like what you see, if you like the tools, you like the UI, uh, then yeah, fund your account. If not, try another one. It doesn't cost you anything uh, to try these things. In fact, we recommend you guys to listen to a show like this, you're new to options. Try the paper trading first because it gives you real world approximations of how these things are trading. And they're pulling this data from the real world markets, but it's not costing you anything. So it's a little bit, little bit easier to kind of wrap your heads around some of these concepts we're talking about, like theta. We talked about at the top of the show, theta out of the money options versus at the money options and how they change 60 days out versus 30 days out. Check that out for yourself in your platform of choice. See how they're priced now. See how they're priced a few days from now, how they were priced. Get a handle for that yourself as you're trading. And as you start doing this, a lot of these concepts will become a lot more evident to you. And then, of course, put some real money, some real skin in the game, and things get a lot more interesting. Uh, so that said, that was kind of a long answer, <laughs> Mr. Dan. Anything you have to add to that? Any any paper trading functionality you really like out there or want to recommend? Uh, I mean, there's a number of them. I mean, as far as getting a simulated account, you know, a paper trading account, I mean, I'm going to elaborate just a little bit on what Mark said. Like, the reason those exist is because the, the, the brokerage firm, they want you to like their platform, so they want to show it to you. So really, I mean, think about it as a way of shopping around. Like, don't look for a good paper trading platform. Like, look for a good platform and then paper trade out. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. It's kind of like a test drive for a car. You know, you want to go out and test drive as many models, make some models as you can uh, until you find the one that you like. And so same thing with platforms. Kick the tires doesn't cost you anything except a little bit of time uh, to kick the tires. And certainly you can go through the partners we have on our network. And that's a good starting point to say, hey, you know, these are the ones these guys work with. I can listen to them. I can listen to the representatives. I can see what they have to say on a variety of these topics and issues and get familiar with them. And now, oh, by the way, let me kick the tires on this platform and see uh, see how it's worked. All right, let's see if we can tackle this one in time here, Dan. So put your listening ears on. This one comes from Jay uh, Detora. He writes, hi, love your show. You guys do a great job. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, he writes, keep up the good work. My question, if I'm looking at a peers trade, I example long Facebook, short Twitter, et cetera. Obviously, I can do it by buying or shorting the stocks. I was trying to figure out if there is any way to effectively do the same thing with options, what the advantages might be, if any. I thought of doing a synthetic long short, but I didn't see any advantage since I'll be naked short an option on both names. But maybe margin treatment is different. Long call on one and long put on the other doesn't seem to make sense as I'm pretty much guaranteed to lose the premium on both of those positions. Is there another or better way to structure this type of trade using options? Thank, thanks, John D. Uh, Dan, this is an interesting question. We were kind of just discussing an aspect of this earlier with the synthetics. He's talking about having essentially a synthetic long position on one name. In this example, Facebook, so it's me long a call, short a put on the same strike versus a synthetic short position in uh, Twitter, which is, of course, you're going to be short the call, long the put on that. And he's kind of concerned about having both of those naked shorts because that's going to tie up a lot of capital, uh, eventually, which he is correct on. Uh, so what do you when you have listeners or not listeners in your case, mostly when you have clients coming to you, saying they like doing peers trading with stocks, where do you tend to steer them with options? Okay, so as far as using synthetic stock here, 
you're you're basically doing the exact same thing as you would be doing by doing the Paris trade with stock, except you do get somewhat better margin on this, probably. You know, I mean, uh, each brokerage firm and clearing firm can margin it somewhat however they want, as long as they're within OCC rules. But you're going to end up getting more favorable margin than if you were doing the stock. Now, to me, I, I don't know. I mean, okay, great. You can do it with better margin. So what? Big deal. Um, I have a class where I specifically talk about doing pairs trades with options. And there's basically, you know, two different ways of doing it. There's a directional pairs trade. Um, and I say directional, even though what you're really doing is, is trading the differential of the two share prices. You can do that or you can trade the volatility differential. Uh, trading the volatility differential is definitely the more complex way of doing it. Basically, you're putting on delta neutral trades so that you're creating, well, effectively synthetic straddles um, and, and trading the vega. You know, you want the volatility of one to rise or fall versus the other one. And yeah, you're going to tie up a lot of margin there. Like you, you can't do this using one lots, you know, when you're doing a pairs trade, especially a volatility pairs trade with options, you know, you're buying calls, you're shorting stock, you've got a whole lot of margin capital tied up, but you're trying to make a very, very small profit, you know, like you're not looking for, you know, the volatility to go from 20 to a thousand, you know, that's not going to happen. It might go from 20 to 25 and you're going to make five Vega points, which could end up being like, you know, 60 bucks per spread. And you've got like tons of money tied up. Now, all this aside, whatever type of pairs trade you're doing using options, much of the issue can be solved by getting portfolio margin. Whether you're doing like you're talking about here, synthetic stock, whether you're doing a pure directional traditional pairs trade by buying one call and selling another call or doing a volatility pairs trade. If you've got portfolio margining on, now you're tying up way, way, way less margin and it becomes a lot more practical. Yeah, portfolio margin is the key to a lot of these <laughs> these these uh, these trades we're talking about here. That's usually most brokers require you to have uh, six figures in your account to even begin that process. So you got to have over a hundred thousand, and then you have to apply to your broker to get that kind of margin treatment. What it does is effectively treats these offsetting positions as if they are actually offsetting. So it reduces your net margin requirements. So a trade like that would definitely. Uh, require that not, not just for the for the margin but also just to have the capital in your account to really do it effectively you want to have a decent size account there uh, but good question and you're right dan it's kind of funny to take people calling and talking in writing in i should say to an options show about pairs trading because when we think options pairs it's a lot of bit different it's it's very much a volatility based thing we don't do a lot of we don't talk at least about here on the show a lot of, of directional type trades like he's talking about getting short the stock getting long the shot but you can you can certainly do that with options as well if you wanted to go about that and get a little bit of a, of a margin advantage particularly if you do have that portfolio margin it'll be a better trade but yeah we like the we like the vol trades whenever possible that's definitely much more in our options wheelhouse but that said we welcome you delta guys too when you guys can all there's room in the options tent for all of you unfortunately there's not much more room in the show here so we have to kind of wind it down here great questions from everybody including some of these epic uh, treatises on options i'm not sure we'll have to try to figure out a way to squeeze some of those in down the road uh, but you guys are great keep those questions coming and before we go mr p what is cooking in the land of market taker or perhaps you got some new new novels on the horizon i know you're betting big in the romance lot novels there so uh so what's coming on the pike in the land of mr p so we've got something really super darn exciting going on. Um, we are having our second annual options retreat is what we're calling it uh, because it kind of is that. Last year we were in Chicago. Maybe some of you guys attended. Uh, that was pretty fun. We had a class at the SIBO, did a tour of the trading floor, and then went to uh, a little reception afterwards uh, on a rooftop overlooking Wrigley Field, watch Cubs game. This year's options retreat is going to be in Sonoma Valley, California, and that is going to be awesome. We did a little survey a while back and asked what classes people want to, you know, want us to teach, and we took all the top suggested classes 
and that's what our syllabus is going to be. There's going to be uh, trading times for the earnings, unusual activity. There's going to be a gamma scalping one, uh, a whole lot of really, really great stuff. And there's going to be a networking wine reception at a really world-class winery. You get to meet and greet other students. You know, some of these people who send in questions here to us, maybe they'll be there as well and you can chat with them. That's going to be really great. If you are interested in attending our second annual options retreat, uh, here's what you do. You go to markettaker.com slash Sonoma, markettaker.com slash Sonoma, and there's a webpage that will tell you all about it. There you go, listeners. Take him up on it. And he was very kind, you know, to send me, you know, two first class tickets out to this retreat and, you know, kind of putting me up for the whole time. So that was that was really above and beyond for you, Dan. So I really appreciate that. And, and I'm looking forward to that spe- special package in the mail any time now, as lo- along with your forthcoming options oriented romance novel. I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> yeah, it just I, I would just keep waiting. It should probably arrive. The today. winds of theta, I believe you called it or something like that. The embrace of decay. There we go. I like it. <laughs> All right, of course, I'm teasing, but surf on over to markettaker.com slash Sonoma. If you've never been out there, it's S-O-N-O-M-A for you spelling impaired out there, and you can get the full, sounds like a pretty cool syllabus, actually. The, the, the sessions you mentioned are certainly top of mind for a lot of our listeners, so check it out. You can get the whole kit and caboodle, see the early bird pricing out there. Uh, should be pretty cool stuff. Check it out, markettaker.com slash Sonoma to learn more. And of course, on behalf of Dan and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there and the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show. And of course, for sending in such fantastic questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next time right here on Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp is produced by the Options Insider, Inc. All rights reserved. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 